Last year, on the great feast of Corpus Christi, we took a look at a type of the Most Blessed Sacrament. We spent some time considering the stupendous miracle of the manna, that miraculous bread that fed the people of Israel for 40 years as they wandered through the desert. Before we go any further, let's remind ourselves what we mean when we say a type. What is a type? A type is a person, a thing, or an action that actually exists, is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Okay, so a type is a person, thing, or action that actually exists, but is intended by God to foreshadow or point forward to a future person, thing, or action. We've talked about it many times, the fact that God intended the things in the Old Testament to foreshadow the New Testament realities, okay? Remember, as we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we're going from the lesser to the greater, from a promise to the fulfillment. So there's this upward trend in salvation, okay? We're going from the level of the promise up to the level of fulfillment in Christ. All right, this year, we'll start by reviewing some of the major events that occurred during the Exodus And then we'll go back and consider just a few aspects of what God was intending to foreshadow there. Okay? All right, we all know it starts with Israel in slavery down in Egypt. God raised up Moses to deliver them. On the night of the Passover, all the people of Israel had to sacrifice that Paschal lamb and mark the lintels of their doors with the blood lamb. Now, St. Jerome said it was marked the sign of the cross. So they'd mark the top like this and the sides like that. Okay? Up and down and right and left. Okay, back and forth. Then they had to cook and eat that lamb. The Lord said, I shall see the blood and shall pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And it came to pass at midnight, the Lord slew every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive woman that was in the prison, and all the firstborn of his cattle. So that's what the sacred word tells us. Of course, the people leave Egypt. The Lord leads them by this pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. They end up on the shores of the Red Sea. They're back to the sea. Here comes Pharaoh bearing down with his army. And just when it looks like they're toast, God instructs Moses to part the sea. And the people of Israel flee through the sea. Pharaoh and his army, falling after them, get washed away, you know. All right, we all know about that. They get the safe getaway. They continue their journey. They continue to be led by this pillar of cloud to Mount Sinai. On the way, they're being fed by that manna from heaven. It's a clear foreshadowing of the Blessed Sacrament. Last year, remember, we took a cue from something Steve Wood says, and we consider what an absolutely stupendous miracle this manna is. Incredible miracle. We saw the manna fall every day except on the Sabbath. Because it didn't fall on the Sabbath twice as much, fell on Fridays. And then given that 1.5 to 2 quarts of manna fell every day per person, at a bare minimum, it pencils out to an incredible miracle because we know how many men there were not counting women and children. That's what the book of Numbers tells us. There's a census right there. Anyway, to get some idea of the scale of the miracle, at a minimum, we want to picture a train pulling 300 grain cars loaded with manna pulling into camp every day and two trains, 300 grain cars long, pulling in on Fridays. Every day, 40 years. That's just the kind of miracle the manna was. And remember, things are going from a foreshadowing, a promise to fulfillment. So if that's the kind of miracle we see in Moses in the Old Testament, it's pointing forward to an even greater miracle, a greater bread from heaven in the New Testament, which is, of course, why we're celebrating Corpus Christi today. Because as great as the manna is, and it's a great miracle, that much greater is a promise fulfilled in Christ, our Lord, truly present, Body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. It's just incredible. We looked at all that last year. Okay, so the people of Israel arrive at Mount Sinai. Moses climbs up into the cloud to talk to the Lord. And then God commands Moses to go down and tell the people. He has to command them. They have to spend the next three days preparing to present themselves before God. What do they have to do? They have to wash their bodies. They have to wash their clothes and abstain from embracing their wives. As Father Haydack wrote centuries ago, quote, All nations seem to have adopted similar observances of continence, 
washing themselves and putting on their best attire when they appeared before God. Close quote. Cornelius Elapide points out some 400 years ago that these exterior practices of cleanliness were intended to prompt the people towards the interior purity they needed to appear before God and also to promote an atmosphere of reverence in which they could receive the divine law. God was going to give them his holy word engraved on the tablets of stone. The people were also strictly warned not to pass beyond the limits that were set for them and touch the holy mountain. They'd have to be killed. They couldn't even be touched. They'd have to be shot through with arrows or stoned to death. If they passed beyond the limits and touched the mountain, it's that holy. So then Moses goes back up in the cloud, receives the Ten Commandments, and at the same time, every possible detail concerning the construction and design of the temple and all the liturgical rules, all of them, all the rubrics. The whole time, what's going on? The mountain's smoking, it's shaking with earthquakes, it's flaming up, there's bolts of lightning, there's storms, you can hear the angels blowing trumpets, and there's whirlwinds going on, thunder rattling everything. Moses comes down and reads the covenant to the people, and they promise to obey the law. Then he goes back up the mountain to speak to the Lord, and the people come to Aaron. Aaron's Moses' brother. He's the high priest. And they ask him, and he goes ahead and makes a golden idol of Apis. Apis is the bull god of the Egyptians. The golden calf is one of the Egyptian idols. That's what they're doing. They're building an Egyptian idol. Think about that. What have they just gone through? What have they just seen? The Passover, the parting of the Red Sea. They're getting the manna from heaven. Here's all this stuff going on in the mountain. There they are, right at the base of the mountain. They face all these miracles right in God's face, and they erect this golden idol right there and, and commit idolatry. Moses comes running down from the mountain and says, If any man be on our Lord's side, let him join me. The tribe of Levi it joins Moses. They take up swords, and they kill all the rebellious idolaters, thousands of men. And because they put their love for the holy will of God before their love for their own flesh and blood, God sets aside the tribe of Levi to be his own priestly tribe. That's how the Levites end up being the priests, because they took a sword to their relatives. Let's quickly consider a few more significant events that took place during the wandering in the desert. We certainly don't have time to go through all 40 years. First... While offering up incense, two of Aaron's sons, they've just been consecrated priests, he's just been consecrated high priest, two of Aaron's sons, right after being consecrated the priesthood, break one of the Lord's liturgical laws. They don't follow the rubric, so to speak, and God strikes them dead. Second, Moses' sister Miriam gets Aaron all stirred up and rises up against Moses and questions his God-given authority, asking, quote, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Close quote. When all of a sudden the Lord then does speak, and he says to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, quote, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle. Close quote. That would be a little scary. And when they get to the entrance of the tabernacle, then from out of the cloud, the voice of the Lord asks Miriam and Aaron, quote, Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Close quote. And Miriam is struck with leprosy. The commentators, Cornelius of Lapide and Hadok, say that Aaron was spared from being struck with leprosy because on the one hand, although Aaron had been stirred up by Miriam's jealousy and backbiting and wound up going along with her, he didn't have any actual malice towards his brother. And on the other hand, out of consideration for Aaron's office as the high priest, God didn't want to make him contemptible in the sight of all the people, and therefore he chose to punish him in a more secret manner. Anyway, Moses also intercedes for his sister, After seven days, she's miraculously cured. Third, a cousin of Moses and Aaron, a man named Kor, along with Dathan and Abiron and 250 other men, rebel against Moses and Aaron and say, quote, You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the people of the Lord? Close quote. Moses tells Kor to tell his men, all right, show up at Tabernacle tomorrow with your thurbles in order to offer incense before the Lord. Keep in the back of your mind what happened to Aaron's sons. The next day, the rebels are busy stirring things up when Moses warns everybody to stand back from the tents of Kor and Dath and Abiram. Here's Moses, quote, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me. If the earth swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into hell, you shall know that they have blasphemed the Lord. 
And immediately as he finished speaking, the earth broke asunder under their feet, and they went down alive into hell, the ground closing about them. Dot, dot, dot. But there was a great miracle wrought that when Kor perished, his sons did not perish. Close quote. Cornelius the Lapidus states that because the wives, servants, and children of Dathan and Abiron, and the wives and, and the servants of all three of the men and the children of Dathan and Abiron, they all consented to the rebellion. They all fell into the pit. But because the sons of Kor did not consent to their father's rebellion, when the earth opened up, they were left miraculously suspended in the air, dangling above the opening till it closed again. So leaders and their followers plummeted into hell. And by the way, if there's any doubt about what it means when the scriptures say falling into hell here, according to the fathers and doctors of the church, including St. Epiphanius, St. Jerome, the Venerable Bede, and St. Robert Bellerman, this is to be literally understood as falling into the place of the damned. So the next time you hear some confused character saying that the church doesn't teach any particular human being is actually in hell, what he's actually telling you, among a whole host of other things, is he's never read the Bible. It still wasn't over. Quote, And a fire coming out from the Lord destroyed the 250 men that offered the incense. Close quote. But the rebellion still hasn't ended. Quote, The following day, all the congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And they started gathering up against Moses and Aaron, and such a big commotion breaks out that the Lord tells Moses to stand back, that he's going to destroy this ungrateful people. But Moses and Aaron run to the tabernacle, and they prostrate themselves before the Lord. They're interceding for the people. And while they prostrate, Moses tells Aaron, grab a thurible and some incense and get out there and hold back the anger of the Lord. Well, as Aaron's going out there, the flames come shooting out from the tabernacle. And uh, Aaron runs out there and stands between the living and the dead and intercedes for them, and that holds back the Lord's anger. Quote, the number of them that were slain were 14,700 men besides them that had perished in the sedition of Kor. Close quote. So that's the third thing we want to consider during the Exodus. Fourth, this will be the last one we'll consider, and then we'll start looking at what all these point forward to. The magician Balaam. Now remember... If you remember reading the books of Moses, the king of the Moabites wants to get these Israeli people out of his country, get out of here. So he hires this magician, go curse him. Well, he isn't able to curse him. But we know Balaam knew that the Israelites would be invisible as long as they remained faithful to God. So he did tell the Moabite king how they could get rid of the men of Israel. Balaam told them, take the most beautiful of their daughters, get them all gussied up, Send them to visit with the men of Israel, but tell them not to yield to any impure desires until the Israelites first offer sacrifice to the idols. Moses tells us exactly what happened. Quote, the people committed fornication with the daughters of Moab, who called them to their sacrifices. And they ate of the sacrifices and adored their gods, and Israel was initiated to Baal-Fagor. Close quote. Cornelius Lapidus says Baalfagor is the same as Bacchus. Bacchus is also known as Dionysus. What does God do? He sends a plague which kills 24,000 men. Okay. Shortly after this, the people that are still surviving end up going to the Holy Land. What have we done? We've just reviewed some of the major events that occurred during the 40 years of wandering the desert. Now let's go back and consider only a few aspects of the foreshadowing here. Obviously, the whole experience of the people of Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, being led by the pillar of cloud and Moses, foreshadows our own life. And of course, liturgically, it foreshadows today's procession, in which we each follow not a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire, but Christ himself and the sacred ministers of his church, all of which liturgically expresses our submission to Christ, our submission to his church, our loving obedience to his commandments, our desire to be led by him into the promised land of heaven. And that's liturgically symbolized by a re-entrance into the church at the end of the procession. For the most part, the foreshadowing expressed in the journey is obvious. Being protected by the blood of the Paschal Lamb, eating the Paschal Lamb are obvious types of the Blessed Sacrament. The passage to the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh and his army is an obvious type of baptism with a corresponding destruction of Satan and his minions and their power over the newly baptized person. Moses, among other things, is a type of the Holy Father. If washing bodies and clothes and abstaining from embracing their wives were meant to prompt the people of the Old Covenant towards an interior purity and atmosphere of reverence, what do they foreshadow 
in the new covenant. They're meant to foreshadow an equally attentive external cleanliness, an equally attentive external preparation by putting on our Sunday best, and an even more reverent external demeanor, precisely because we're not coming to present ourselves before our Lord under the, under the appearance of a pillar of a cloud, but before our Lord really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the most blessed sacrament of the altar. And all that requires a correspondingly higher degree of interior purity and reverence and holiness for the same reason. All that points to the absolute importance of making sure we've made a good confession in the new covenant since we actually receive God into the temples of our bodies, huh? We have to make sure we hear the warning of St. Paul that we heard in today's epistle, that we first examine our consciences before we go to communion so that we don't eat and drink judgment onto ourselves. Moses coming down from the holy mountain with the word of God carved into stone tablets is a type of the priest coming down from the altar with the word of God made flesh. Mount Sinai is a type of the altar in a Catholic church. We can see that by the prayers at the foot of the altar at the beginning of Mass. It actually refers to the altar as thy holy mountain. That's one of the things the priest is saying before he goes up to the altar of God, onto thy holy mountain. And at a high Mass, like this morning, when the priest first goes up there, it's shrouded by a cloud of incense, huh? When the priest goes up to it. And it will be again right after the creed. The fact that the people would be killed if they dared to touch the holy mountain and the striking down of priests for violating the rubrics foreshadows spiritual damages that happen in the new covenant if anyone transgresses the liturgical laws set by God or holy church. The rebellion of Miriam with the cooperation of Aaron, insisting that the Lord not spoken only through Moses but also through her, foreshadows, among other things, Modern feminist, religious, frustrated and crippled by the blight of feminism. Her leprosy is a disgusting, depilating physical condition which foreshadows some far more repulsive and disgusting spiritual effects on the soul of someone in rebellion against the divinely instituted hierarchy of the church. Aaron's cooperation foreshadows a modern priest or prelate who at least passively cooperates with these poor, unhappy women saying, in fact, to them, thank you very much for that apple. The rebellion of Kor, all the congregation are holy, every one of them. The Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourself above the, uh, you, know, you know, above the people, so forth? Foreshadows, among other things, the whole liberal call to action. We're all priests, uh, nonsense, huh? But that's not all. Centuries ago, Father Hadak writes of the rebellion of Kor, quote, The crime of these men, which was punished in so remarkable of manner, was that of schism and of rebellion against authority established by God in the church, and the pretending that the priesthood without being lawfully called and sent, the same is the case of all modern heretics and schismatics. He's writing two centuries ago. Let them dread a similar punishment, not only the authors of such wicked pretensions, but also those who consent to them. We cannot reckon less than 15,000 who perished in consequence of their inheritance to core. Close quotes. Finally, what is the situation with the Moabite woman, uh, women foreshadow? It points backwards and it points forwards. Backwards, it's just a replay of the Garden of Eden with a supporting cast of thousands. Whenever the devil wants to take out a society, he corrupts the women. Whenever the devil wants to take out a society, women are the moral peg on which the world is hung. That's the dignity of a woman. That's the power of the woman. That's how God made them. And the devil certainly is aware of that. When a society is holy, it is because, in general, the women in that society are holy, because they have high moral standards, because in some way they're imitating, or in this case, they're at least foreshadowing Our Lady. When a society is wicked, it is because, in general, the women in that society have low moral standards. In some way, they're imitating Eve. General women set the moral level in a society. What an awesome power God has entrusted you with. It's awesome. Young ladies need to realize the incredible dignity and gift that God has blessed you with, the incredible dignity that you have. 
The holy pride you ought to have that you're a member of the same sex as Our Lady. The holy pride you ought to have that you're a daughter of Mary. The holy pride you ought to have that God trusts you so much. He's put such an incredible power in your hands. He's put such an incredible moral force for goodness in your hands. So we considered what the situation with the Moabite women points backwards to. What does it foreshadow? It foreshadows any society which allows worship according to the rites of Dionysus. Human nature never changes. Devils don't get any older. They do the same things over and over, which means any society that allows that kind of worship will follow the same path as the path of the people of Israel in the desert. They will turn away from the true God and they will turn towards the worship of idols. So what does that mean? What is worship according to the right of Dionysus? It's ancient. It's always the same. Wild music, intoxication, dancing under frenzy, immodest behavior, nude women. In modern terms, rock and roll concerts, MTV, Unfortunately, high school proms, bar scene, things like that. They're just electrified Dionysian rites. That's all they are. No different. Let's close with inspired words of St. Paul, the chapter right before today's epistle. I want you to know, brethren, their fathers were all under the cloud. And all passed through the sea. And all ate the same supernatural food. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. Now these things are warnings for us. Not to desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. We must not indulge in morality as some of them did, 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put the Lord to the test. Now, these things happened to them as a warning, but they were written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. All our fathers ate the same supernatural food, But with most of them, God was not well pleased. These things are warnings for us. Not to desire evil as they did. These things are warnings for us. These things are warnings for us.